Then let us drink to Queen Vashti, the most beautiful in the land. Uh, serious? I demand Vashti be here before. Already rumors circulate as to why the Queen holds her own feast instead of attending yours. They sound riotous, my lord. They fear a divided kingdom. My lord, you know the Queen's position on the wall. Send for her. I'm Queen, not a pawn, and I will not lower my dignity. No shame my reign. By wearing the royal crown before you're drunk and thinly veiled war council. My lord, what answer do I send the queen? The land has no more queen. Psalm 33, 9. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. We're going to begin a study the next few weeks on the book of Esther. An exciting book, a great story, a historical story, and uh, we'll begin this journey today. We'll be going together, oh, seven or eight uh, weeks together. And so let's, let's put this story into historical perspective because the Bible is history. About 600 B.C., around 2,900 or 2,619 years ago, give or take a few decades, Nebuchadnezzar invaded Judah. And if you read the book of Daniel, you'll read about this invasion of Judah by Nebuchadnezzar. And you recall in your own Bible study that, that he took the best people with him and he took them out of Judah to, to Babylon. Some of the names you recognize, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, those names we know from the book of Daniel. And they lived in Babylon and made that their new home and Daniel became a leader in that nation. Some 60 years later, Cyrus, king of Persia, remember the handwriting on the wall, literally? Uh, he came and invaded. And after he invaded there, he said to the people, he said, listen, if you want to go back to Jerusalem and, and start rebuilding the temple, you can do that. And so some people went back. In fact, the map we have here shows um, this is where the story of Esther takes place. And they could go back to Jerusalem, which was part of the empire, and they could start rebuilding the temple. The book of Ezra talks about the rebuilding of the temple from the people there. Now, from our history books, you may remember uh, a story about the Battle of Thermopylae in 480 B.C., if you saw the movie 300 some, some years ago, it depicted that. The, the blood-hungry, the bloodthirsty king of Persia, his name was Xerxes, he attempted to invade Greece along a thin strip of land in Thermopylae. And, and 300 Spartans, these, these warriors led by Leonidas, they gave their lives for this cause. If you know the story, they all were killed, but they stopped the movement of the Persians into Greece at that battle. And the Persians tried this again. The Xerxes tried this again and were defeated again by the Spartans. Now, this is history. But what I think is beautiful about that story is the, per, the, 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 the preservation of Greece from these Persians back hundreds of years, thousands of years ago, that literally preserved the democracy that we have in our United States today. Because our country is built upon a lot of principles that came from early Greek culture. And so the Battle of Thermopylae was an epic battle that allowed America in many ways to be what it is today. So, enough history. Between the time of Ezra 
And this Battle of Thermopylae, snuck in here is the story of Esther. The historical story of Esther found in the book of Esther. I'd invite you to turn there because we're going to walk through some verses here. And, and what's happening in the book of Esther? We saw a little bit of the, the, the debauchery that the story begins with in the video. And many Jewish people who had been taken from their homeland lived in the city of Susa, which is where the story takes place. And many people lived in Babylon. They lived in Susa, and they, they had kids there. They grew up there, and they were born there. So this is what they knew. And, and so the, many of them knew nothing else. And life wasn't so bad either for these people. They weren't slaves. They were living in a country that wasn't their own, but yet they were living in peace. Now, the book of Esther, as you probably know, is something of an enigma in the Scriptures. And because in, in the book of Esther, the word God is never written in there. There's no Jehovah written. There's no Yahweh. There's no God. There's nothing. His name is not written in this book. Now, there is fasting in there, which implies there's prayer, but God's name is not obvious here. Now, some scholars of Hebrew say that in the original language of Esther, in the original Hebrew, there, there were the, the, the letters that make up the word Yahweh were hidden in there. And, and in some manuscripts, I'm told, the letters that make up the name of God were written bigger than the other letters. But at the very least, at the very most, God was implied in the book of Esther. So, so why in the world did the Bible scholars years ago say, let's put Esther in our canon. Let's put Esther in our Bible. I believe it's because God's working is unmistakable in the book of Esther. And even though we don't see him, we see his fingerprints all over these pages. And, and we see that, that he is, is in, in control of some things, and, and he's maneuvering history so he can work through history. Now, don't hear me what I'm not saying. I'm not saying he brings evil upon us, but his fingerprints are in the story of Esther. And, and it's only when we look back at history, we, and we, we can dust those fingerprints and see his working in this book as, from our perspective so we'll be looking at God's fingerprints as we go through the story of Esther. Now, the book is perfect for movies. This is a movie. There's been a number of movies on Esther, and, and um, Major Hoskins spoke of that uh, some time ago when he preached on the book of Esther. And there's lots of movies. It's a perfect story for a movie. It, it has, I mean, some people say the Bible is soft. The Bible is love. The Bible is peace and warm fuzzies. Not so in the book of Esther. The book of Esther has parties. You saw one. The book of Esther has power. The book of Esther has pride. Romance is in the book of Esther. Mystery is in the book of Esther. Secret plans, machinations for evil and good are, are hidden, and you'll see that thread throughout this book. Suspense and plot twists are all in these few chapters in the book of Esther. And I hope you'll have a, an inkling to go back and say, well, let me read that. I want to find out what's going on because it's a great, great book. But all through this book, we see God at work, even though the people of that day maybe didn't see it, we may not see it, but God works through circumstances and people. And the strange thing is, he works through people even if they're non-believers. We didn't see any believers here. There were no, no God worshipers in that, in that clip. But God works through people even that don't believe him to bring about his plan in the world. And if we can take one theme from this book, one theme that you'll hear as we go through this is God has not turned his back on his people. And God has not turned his back on you. And God has not turned his back on me. So let's open our books, let's open our Bibles, and look at Esther and find out what God has to say to us through this beautiful writing. It takes place in Susa, as we saw on the map. Now, Susa is modern-day Iraq. And we hear about Iraq and Iran, and we hear about the Jews today. This is today's news. And there's a palace there. And King Xerxes, the same king who later on attacked the Spartans, uh, tried to attack Greece, he, he uh, lived in this palace. Now, if you read the King James Bible, his name is Ahasuerus. Same guy, different names, okay? And, and today's uh, sermon is called power play because we see in this first chapter a struggle for power. 
Power is addictive. And it was addictive then, and sadly, power is addictive now. And King Xerxes wanted ultimate power. He wanted ultimate dominion. That's why he later on tried to attack Greece. And, and King Xerxes showed no mercy. Three people, or groups, groups of people, that are seeking power in this chapter. First of all, there's the King Xerxes himself. He is power hungry. He was given some. He wanted all. But his queen, as we saw, she wanted some power too. And she wouldn't let him control her. And then, as we'll see in a few minutes, minutes, not only the king or his queen, but his assistants, his nobles, also wanted power. So the king threw a party. We saw that depicted here. A huge party. The purpose of this party was to show off his wealth. And he brought hundreds of people into his palace. And this, this party lasted six months. It's one of the longest banquets recorded in history. A six-month party, 180 days, and people there, I mean, there was debauchery like we can't imagine, I know, in that party. And after that big party, then he had a special private party for about a week in his palace, and it was in the enclosed gardens. I'm sure you had to have a special invitation to get to the enclosed garden party. And verse 6 in Esther chapter 1 talks about his wealth. The garden had hangings of white and blue linen fastened with cords of white linen and purple material to silver rings on marble pillars, couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of marble, mother of pearl, other costly stones. There was opulence. There was wealth. There was everything anyone would ever desire there. Verses 7 and 8 said there was an open bar there. No drink limit. And they drank all they wanted to. And it was a men's club that day. Because this was a men-only affair. So I'm not making any kind of a commentary on that. In that some of our women are at women's retreat today. But it's a, it was a men's club. And so the men had a party for the men. And the queen had her own party too in another room. So there was, a, there was the women's party next door or perhaps. And when the king was drunk. Vashti got drunk. He said, I want my queen to come and show herself off at my party. I want her wearing her royal crown, and I want all my partiers to see her beauty. Now, we're adults here. I think every one of us is an adult here. You can read through that. It probably was not a very wholesome atmosphere at that party. And so she was the only possession that he had that he had not yet displayed to the guests at his party. The ultimate display of power is saying, let me bring my queen and show her off to my people. Verse 12. But when the attendants delivered the king's command, Queen Vashti refused to come, and the king became furious and burned with anger. Now, this was not expected. He didn't expect to have the queen defy him. No one defies the king. No one defies Xerxes. I mean, he wages war and servants are at his beck and call. And now this queen, this woman says to him, nope, I'm not coming. He was stumped. What do I do with this? I've never had this happen before. And so he had asked advice from his experts. I'm going to start at verse 13 here. Um, since it was customary for the king to consult experts in matters of law and justice, he spoke with the wise men who understood the times and were closest to the king. And it lists their names there, which I don't want to attempt to pronounce. Um, verse 15, according to the law, what must be done to Queen Vashti, he asked. She's not obeyed the command of King Xerxes that the eunuchs have taken her. Then Mamukin replied, in the presence of the king and the nobles, Queen Vashti has done wrong, not only against the king, but also against all the nobles and the people of all the province of King Xerxes. For the queen's conduct will become known to all the women, and so they will despise their husbands and say, King Xerxes commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before, but she would not come. This very day, 
the Persian and Median women of the nobility who've heard about the queen's conduct will respond to all the king's nobles in the same way. There will be no end of disrespect and discord. These wise men were not simply looking out for the king. They were looking out for themselves. And they said, king, listen, this is bigger than you. Because if your queen doesn't obey you, our wives are not going to obey us. And we need to have the power over our wives, and we can't have that. And so we've got to do something serious because we've got to show this queen that she can't do this. And all of our wives got to have to look at that and realize they can't have that power either. So here's the solution, Mr. King. Make a law. Now, as you probably know, the law of the Medes and the Persians here, they, they, they didn't have erasers on their pens. Because whenever a law was made, it could not be changed. There was a law that said, once a law is made, you can't change it, like we do here in America sometimes. They said, make a law that will never be changed, and this law is going to be this. The queen will never come before the king again. She's fired. And somebody better will be found to be the queen, someone that respects the king. So they made this law, but not only that, they had to send this law around the country so all the women in the country would hear it. Verse 20. And when the king's edict is proclaimed throughout all his vast realm, all the women will respect their husbands from the least to the greatest. Verse 22, I love this. And he sent dispatches to all the parts of the kingdom, to each province in his own script, to each people in their own language, proclaiming that every man should be ruler over his own household using his native tongue. In other words, men, take control of your wives. And so they made a law saying, men, you're in charge. No clapping here. Oh, please, current commissioner. I'm not going there, so. <laughs> now, Esther, our heroine, is not going to come on stage till next week. But God is setting things in place for her appearance. God's power is working through sinful, alcohol-filled, defiant men to bring circumstances in place for his good, as we're going to see. Now, God is not endorsing the actions of these evil people. But his fingerprints are working through circumstances to bring about his plan for this story. The king thought he was in control. The queen, Vashti, thought she was in control in defying him. And the nobles thought they were in control trying to keep their wives under their thumb. But God is always in control. God had all power, and God had all control, even through people that thought they had the hand on the control of the situation. God has written a beautiful book here of Esther with, with twists and turns and surprises, all to bring about God's will, as we'll be seeing later on. God is writing a beautiful story, not only here, but he's writing a story in your life and in my life. And in your life and my life, there's twists and turns, aren't there? There's, there's some twists and turns that we may be joyful about. We may say, thank you, God, for happening. There's some twists and turns we may say, God, I didn't expect that. God, how can you do that? How can you let that happen? in my life. We, everyone here, I'm sure, has a twist and turn you can look at and say, I didn't realize that was what was going to happen in my life. Many of us can look back and see his working in our lives, can't we? And all of us can look forward with anticipation as to what God has in store for you and for me. We can look back, we can see his fingerprints on our lives. We can see how we may have made mistakes and he's guided us back. We may see how, how we may have done something and, and someone spoke to us and, and guided us. His fingerprints are on your life and on mine. And in the future as we face tomorrow and the days ahead, his fingerprints are there as well, making the circumstances according to what he would have for you and for me. Let's be real here. Sometimes life happens and it seems like God may be unlocatable, doesn't it? It's a hard place to be 
when we cry out and, and, and we say, God, how would you let this happen to me? And it seems sometimes you and I may be forced to walk a lonely path. But when we come through it and look back, we can say, ah, oh, I see why that person said that. Or I see why that circumstance happened. I, I see God's fingerprints in that. There's a passage in an obscure little book, Habakkuk chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 2 through 5. Habakkuk felt the same way. He says, how long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Oh, cry out, you violence, but you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There's strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. Have you felt that way ever? The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted, Habakkuk says. Look at verse 5. This is the Lord's answer. Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed for I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. A few weeks ago, Major Pam's brother and sister-in-law came and visited us here. They live in, in uh, Arkansas. And we were just chatting, and she was telling us about her grandchildren, as you like to talk about your grandchildren, as do we. And she was saying that her grandson likes to make cookies with her. And so they'll be sitting down, and, and they will put the different ingredients into the mix, and the child will say, I like that. I, I don't like that. And so she said, I tell you what, why don't you taste everything we put into the cookies before we mix them up? So here, take a taste of this flour. Ugh, yuck. Put it in there. Here, have some unsalted butter. Ugh, nasty. Let's put that in there. Here, smell some vanilla extract. Ooh, yeah. Put drop in there. Have some chocolate chips. Ooh, I like those. I'll take some of those. Put them in there. Here, drink some milk. Okay, that's fine. Sugar, yum, that's great. And she would say, look, as I mix these into the batter, I mix these into the bowl, what happens is even the things you don't like that don't taste good by themselves, when they're mixed together with heat, the result is something delicious. It's funny when um, um, Major Pam's sister-in-law told that story, I said to her, I said, I think I found an illustration. I said, that'll preach. You know, things may come into our lives that just don't seem fair, do they? Things come into our lives that, that don't seem to make sense. Things come into our lives that metaphorically leave a bad taste in our mouth. But you know, God can take the flour of our failures. God can take the sugar of our success. Or God can take the cream of our circumstances, blend them together with heat. And, and in his sovereign will, they bring out his purpose in our lives. So the key for you and me is how do we navigate these unexpected turns of events that come our way? We looked recently at the Sermon on the Mount and Christ talked about the narrow gate or the wide gate. Do we remain on that narrow path when those days get dark? Or, or do we quit walking with him? Or, or do we blame him for what's happening to us? So if you're experiencing a twist this morning, if you're experiencing a turn in your life right now, you may wonder in the deep of your soul, look, where, where is God? He's unreachable right now. Why isn't he helping me out of this situation? If you're tempted to quit this, this whole thing, don't forget the unsalted butter. Don't forget the vanilla extract. Don't forget the dry, tasteless flour and hold on as it goes through the heat and let's find out what delicious outcome God has for you. The book of Esther is a perfect example of twists and turns, of unknown events that are taking place, people that thought they were in control, evil people. But through God's fingerprints, God's machinations, God's working, his will was manifested in the book of Esther. And his will we manifested in you and in me. 
as a chorus is 353. Be still, for the power of the Lord is moving in this place. He comes to cleanse and to heal, to minister His grace. No work too hard for Him. In faith, receive from Him. Be still, for the power of the Lord is moving in this place. If you feel the power of the Lord nudging you in your own soul, if His power says, listen, the power is moving here, and maybe He wants to move you down here and say, Lord, I'm, I'm facing a twist and a turn I can't figure out. But Lord, I, I, I'm tasting that vanilla extract, that flour. The things I don't like are part of my life right now. But I know, Lord, that you are, I, I have faith. You're going to blend them into something that's going to be beautiful. If you're there right now, then maybe he wants you to step out in faith and say, Lord, I don't know what's ahead, but I believe that you have your fingerprints on my life. And you will guide me and help me through the difficult days. Let's sing this chorus. It's the third verse of this course. If God is speaking to you that way, then respond. And let's let the Lord speak to our hearts this morning. Even though this passage of Scripture doesn't list your name, your fingerprints are there. And God, even though we may not sense you around us at different times in our lives, your fingerprints are there. Even though we don't see you perhaps working directly uh, through us or in us or around us, God, we believe your fingerprints are there. And God, as we look back and, and see the places our lives have been, we can say, ah, I see the dusting of time now has revealed those fingerprints and you showed us exactly how you worked in that situation, unbeknownst to us. And God, if anyone here is, is dealing with a situation in which they don't know quite what to do, God, we ask you would just guide them. Help them to take one step in front of another. Help them to walk in faith, believing that you are guiding them and guiding the circumstances. God, we learn from your word, you don't bring evil upon us. But everything that happens to us comes through your hands and you are there with us. And when the days are dark and when the, the path is lonely, we pray that we will continue to follow your leading and in faith know that you are with us and your fingerprints are guiding us. 
Thank you for this reminder from this old ancient book of Esther as we continue our journey next week. For it's in your holy and your precious name we pray. Amen.